People think we know more about the brain than we do. We know how the basic chemistry, we know how neurons fire. We also know quite a bit about how big bits of the brain work. What we're almost clueless on is kind of the mechanics of it. How the basic chemistry connects with the large scale functions. So like we know the top and the bottom, but we don't know about the middle. I'm here with Professor Philip Golf. I was I, I was very excited to meet you. You can't imagine, actually. Oh. And first question is, what is consciousness, Mr. Philip Golf? Well, thank you very much. That's really lovely to hear that you've been excited to meet me. Um, consciousness is just, I, I, I like the way Thomas Nagel famously defined it. He says, your consciousness is just what it's like to be you. So right now you're having a visual experience of me in front of you, colors around you an auditory experience of my voice speaking to you. Does the phone has? Well, steady on, steady on. That's another, that's another question, I guess. I guess at least in our common sense way of thinking about things, we don't think this, the phone has consciousness. So to ask the question, Nagel says, if you want to know if something's conscious, you're asking, is this something that it's like to be it, right? So. There's something that it's like to be you right now. There's something that it's like for a rabbit to be cold. Or, so the phone is not, it, is it there doesn't anything feel that it's like? something to be like a phone. Might, might I don't feel. think so. And at least common sense tells us there's nothing that it's like to be the phone, but it, it's difficult to rule it out, right? It seems like you can like take a fly. If you see a fly banging against the window, like trying to get out, is there something that it's like for the fly to bang against the window? Maybe some <laughs> very simple version of something. Or is a fly just a mechanism, a complicated mechanism that's unfeeling, uh, just, just designed to do that? Um, so it seems like whatever you learned about the inner workings of the fly, it would always leave open that question. Is there something that it's like to be the fly? Does it have an inner life? And that's part of why this is such a deep philosophical challenge. Yes, wh why this is so important, this consciousness question, I, I can't understand why is everyone talks about it and like, it seems like nobody knows how to get a hang of it. Well, why is consciousness important? I mean, I think consciousness is at the root of human identity. Fundamentally, we relate to each other as beings with feelings and experiences. I think consciousness is at the root of everything that matters really from deep emotions, subtle thoughts, beautiful sensuous experiences. Um, consciousness is, is what makes us human. Um, the challenge is, well, for decades, people have been wrestling with what's become known as the hard problem of consciousness, the challenge of explaining how brains produce consciousness and I but, would say that- and, and we didn't find it yet. That project has gone, in my view, precisely nowhere. <laughs> we don't have even the beginnings of an explanation of how- To find out where is consciousness uh, is uh, in our brain and- I, I think that's a slight, so I think there are two questions, right? One question is which kinds of brain activity are correlated with conscious experience? And I think we have made some progress on that, although it's still hugely controversial, because although you can't look inside someone's brain and see their feelings, what you can do if it's another human being, you can ask them, you know, what are you feeling now? And if you do that while you scan their brain, then you can start to hone in on which kinds of physical activity go along with which kinds of experience. And that's a very important scientific project. But so, to my mind, that's not a full theory of consciousness because what we ultimately want explained is why? Why do certain kinds of brain activity go along with certain kinds of experience? Well, why should brain activity go along with consciousness at all? That is the deep mystery that people are still- I, I don't understand with. the difference be uh, between what we're trying to do with the brain to understand and what <clears> is the difference with what you're asking. Why, why? Yeah. The fundamental difference between the two. I mean, if you, 
if you study some chemistry, for example, think, you know, why does water boil at 100 degrees? Once you learn about the chemistry, and it's very detailed, can get a bit boring, but you, I think you get a complete explanation of that. Um, once you understand how the various chemical components connect in the, in the, the boiling process, you understand, oh yeah, that's totally obvious. In fact, it, it's impossible, it becomes impossible to imagine it not happening once you understand enough chemistry. But coming to the case of neuroscience, it seems that all of our neuroscientific explanations, what do neuroscientists talk about? They talk about neural firings and electrochemical signalings and how that processes information and leads to behavior and the way we interact with you. All of that story could go on without even talking about conscious experience. If, if we're just going off, if you were an alien and came from another planet and you read about the neuroscience of our brains, you might think these are just complicated mechanisms. They don't, they don't have feelings and experiences. They're just like complicated robots interacting with the environment. It'd be like us with the fly thinking, it does a fly have an inner life? It's hard to ever pin that down. So our whole, rich as it is, and one, I absolutely love neuroscience, but none of it seems to shed any light on why we have experience at all, why we're not just complicated mechanisms. And why you think we have. And by the way, I want to tell you that you are the person responsible for making me vegetarian. Oh, really? I'm <laughs> yeah. not a vegetarian myself. But. <laughs> yeah, but because you are talking yeah. about what is uh, all these topics, I, I will share about why exactly right. later, but tell me or why, why you think uh, we have consciousness. Right. Well, I'd like to hear about your story about your vegetarianism. <laughs> I've got, I'm wrestling with that all the time myself. <laughs> but, uh, well, you see, I think we've been asking the wrong question. So we've spent all these decades with this hard problem of consciousness, trying to explain uh, consciousness in terms of physical processes in the brain, we've got nowhere. I think we should try doing it the other way around. So instead of starting with the physical world and explaining consciousness in terms of physical processes, what we do is we start with consciousness and we try to explain the emergence of the physical world in terms of underlying facts about consciousness. And it turns out that is actually really easy to do. How? So this is the- And um, how do we start yeah. from consciousness? So this is the, uh, where, we, where I draw inspiration and others from really important work in the 1920s by the philosopher and Nobel Prize winner, Bertrand Russell, and also the scientist, Arthur Eddington, who was incidentally the first scientists to experimentally confirm Einstein's general theory of relativity, which made Einstein an overnight celebrity. Uh, so I, mean, I, th I, I think Russell in particular, Bertrand Russell in particular, should be seen as the Darwin of consciousness. I think he essentially settled the mystery in my view. Okay. But for various historical I'm reasons, to hear why. <laughs> this got forgotten about for a long time, but it's recently been rediscovered and there's sort of a new generation of Bertrand Russell inspired panpsychist philosophers and I'm one of those people. Yeah, so I think what, what, what Russell and Eddington were thinking about in the 1920s was trying to think what follows from the fact that our fundamental science is purely mathematical, right? And that's something like we're so used to, we kind of really take it for granted. But this was actually a radical innovation in the 17th century of Galileo. <laughs> Galileo said, right, from now on, science, our fundamental science is gonna be purely mathematical and it's been like that ever since. Uh, and that's very useful, right? If you're a practicing scientist, you, mathematics is very useful. Why he said that? Well, he was just thinking that, why Galileo? Or, or uh, Russell, sorry. Ra Russell. Uh, Galileo. Galileo, so Galileo, yeah, yeah. Um, well, Galileo wanted, understood the, the value of mathematics and the, how you can get very precise and you can get very precise predictions and you can formulate mathematical laws 
Uh, and then a short while later, we get Newton with this very simple equation, which tells us force of gravity that governs not just on the Earth, but throughout all of space. That would not have been possible without Galileo's revolutionary idea. Let's do science with maths or math if you're American. Um, <laughs> but, but Galileo wrestled with this actually because... I think Galileo understood that you can't capture conscious experience in these terms. Because if you think about your conscious, I invite viewers now and yourself, it is to, to think about your own experience, you know, colors and sounds and smells and tastes. I think Galileo understood you can't capture these qualities in the purely quantitative language of mathematics, you can't capture, you know, the redness of a red experience. Think about seeing a beautiful sunset, that redness in your experience in this abstract language of mathematics. And this was probably why before Galileo, people didn't try to do this. So Galileo essentially said, right, well, if we want science to be mathematical, we have to take consciousness out. So he's, he was like, I can't describe all this stuff with uh, with mathematics. I can uh, at least ta stuff are not very tangible for me to play with them and understand them. So let's take take them out of the equation and let's play with what we understand. This is what exactly you, what exactly Galileo essentially gave scientists a more focused task. It wasn't he wasn't he certainly wasn't saying consciousness doesn't exist. He was saying it's just. Put that on one side for a rainy day. You know, let's just focus on what we can capture in mathematics. That was the start of mathematical physics. And that has gone unbelievably well. And I think a few hundred years later, that we're now in this period of history where people are so blown away by this success and the wonderful technology. And you can speak to people on YouTube and all the incredible send people to the moon. The people now are thinking, oh, this is the truth. This is the complete truth. It's going to explain consciousness. No, the irony is the reason it's been so successful is because it was designed to exclude consciousness. If we now want to bring consciousness into the scientific story, we need to rethink that uh, conception of science bequeathed to us by Galileo that was designed to ignore consciousness. Uh, so I, I have an analogy in my book, Galileo's Error, um, that might be useful. It's here. Oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to appear somewhere. Um, magically. The wonders of technology. Uh, the wonders of mathematics. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, so in, if you're a philosophy professor or any kind of professor in the UK, at least, you've got three jobs. Teaching, writing, and administration, Right. And it's always the administration I've always found hardest, you know, be a bit boring. And But when in my first year as a professor, uh, my boss said to me, you know, don't worry about administration for the first term, you know, just focus on writing and teaching. And I did the job quite well. Now, the fact that I was good at when, you, when I didn't have to do administration, the fact that I was good at the job when I didn't have to do administration, obviously doesn't give you reason to think I'm going to be good at the administration. And sadly, I was pretty awful, but but I think I try hard. Because, so. uh, because you excluded it. Yeah, that, was, the, that was the whole point. I did good at the job because I was allowed to ignore. And similarly, this is essentially what Galileo did, right? He said, science, just ignore consciousness for a bit. The fact that it's done well since it ignored consciousness doesn't give us reason to think it's going to do well when we bring consciousness back in. And this, so this is important. I mean, I've debated a lot with the neuroscientist Anil Seth, and I've had some fun Twitter rows with uh, the neurophilosopher Patricia Churchland. And these guys think, look, science is so successful. Of course, it's going to explain. Look at its track record. But I think, I mean, I, of course, science is amazing and rightly celebrated. Uh, but I think we need to understand the history of this, uh, which is explains why science is so successful, but also why it has a very limited, precise application. Okay, let's go back uh, to what you're saying. Galileo made the error and we all focused all our lives now and everything around us is based on mathematics and science. And now we came to the problem. 
that we don't understand consciousness because we excluded it a lot of years ago from the equation. So what do we do now? How do we understand? Good. So Galileo gave us the problem. And I think 300 years later, Russell and Eddington came up with the solution. Um, so Russell was thinking about this mathematics business in a different way. Um, he was thinking, you know, so it's very useful if you're a scientist to do things mathematically. But right, what if you're a philosopher? What if you're a philosopher interested in the ultimate nature of reality? What, what do we do with the fact that our basic science is just mathematical? What does that mean? And what Russell decided it meant is that it means that our, our basic science, that is physics, doesn't really tell us what ultimate reality is. It just describes its mathematical structure. Oh, interesting. So it actually leaves the the most important question unanswered. It's not really, to put it, it's not really because telling Because science us. is trying to describe everything mm. around us. So if it removes, excludes that, it's kind of miss a big picture. Yeah, around. it's not, I mean, even putting on one side the consciousness issue, because physics is purely mathematical, it's not really telling us what stuff is. Or to put it another way, physics really just tells us how stuff behaves, what it does. Think about, you know, what does physics tell us about an electron? You know, electrons are one of the smallest things matter's made up of. Um, what does physics tell us? It tells us it has mass and charge. And then you think, well, what does physics tell us about mass? Roughly, it tells us that things with mass attract other, ooh, attract other things with mass, that's gravity, and they resist acceleration, the more massive it, it's just like what they do. Or charge, opposites attract, uh, like charges repel. It's all about what stuff does. Physics, you think our physics is giving us, telling us what space and time and matter are. Actually, no. It's just telling us what they do. It's telling us their abstract mathematical structure. Um, and so really, fundamental reality could turn out to be anything as long as it does the right stuff, it has the ma right mathematical structure, you could get physics out of that. Um, so, so, so this has inspired many to, to this panpsychist view. So the basic idea is that at the fundamental level of reality, what we have are networks of very simple conscious entities interacting in very simple, predictable ways because they have very simple experiences. Through their interactions, they realize certain patterns, certain mathematical structures. And then the thought is those mathematical structures just are what we call physics. So you get physics out of underlying facts about consciousness. So you can't get consciousness out of physics, but it's dead easy to get physics out of consciousness. We know that can be done. So that's really the, I mean, maybe it helps. I often like to give this line Stephen Hawking gave at, on the final page of his famous book, The Brief History of Time. He said, even when we get final physics, it's just going to be a bunch of equations. It's not going to tell us what breathes fire into the equations. So for the panpsychist, it's consciousness that breathes fire into the equations. So let's, uh, let's take the example of maybe my phone. Yeah. Where is, uh, what do you mean? Where is the consciousness in my phone with your panpsychist view? So uh, consciousness kind of emerge out of this? Uh, so it's important that panpsychists don't necessarily think absolutely everything is conscious. The basic commitment is that the, the fundamental building blocks of reality maybe electrons and quarks, fundamental particles, have incredibly simple forms of experience. Uh, That's so the basic it is commitment. something to feel like, something to be that it's like, like something. in electrons. Yes, yeah, so think, you know, that what it's like to be you is incredibly complex and rich. <laughs> don't, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> You're being too modest. Um, what it's like to be a sheep is maybe a bit simpler, a lot simpler. What it's like to be a flies if there's something that's like to be flies much simpler again what it's th think about like a bed bug is there something if there's something that it's like to be a bed bug 
As we go to simpler and simpler forms of life, we get simpler and simpler forms of experience. For the panpsychist, this continues right down to the fundamental building blocks of matter, which and, have incredibly and, simple... And why so. one to have hmm. more consciousness or more f- feeling of uh, it's like to be that thing of the other? Like So w- that, that one, one is, feels less to be that in comparison to me. So, mm. so it's kind of consciousness has levels. Yeah, to the extent that I think something that's very complicated, like your brain, that's the result of millions of years of evolution. Uh, and actually, early on after Darwin, many panpsychist philosophers and scientists, uh, such as William James, uh, is he going to magically appear when I say that? Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> um, you can use it. You can say oh, can names. I do it as well? <laughs> oh, brilliant. Um, William James. Do you know that no, I don't. Um, thought, appreciated how well panpsychism fits with Darwinism, right? Because if you're, if you're not a panpsychist, you know, we've got evolution and these matter getting more complicated. And, and then suddenly at some point, a miracle happens and consciousness, the lights turn on, consciousness appears. Whereas for the panpsychist, we start with very simple forms of consciousness and over millions of years, evolution molds them into the very complex forms of experience that you're And it's not that right the now. one is more levels above than the other, is the, is, is the same? Is... Different people would have different views. I tend to not, I tend to think that Consciousness doesn't really come in levels, so it depends what you mean by levels, but something's either conscious or it's not. But certainly consciousness can be more complicated depending on the complexity of the thing that is conscious. The brain has 86 billion neurons and um, hundreds of thousands of connections. Um, so, whereas an electron, if there's something that it's like to be an electron, it's going to be incredibly simple, reflecting its incredibly simple nature. But just to be clear, panpsychists don't necessarily think your phone is conscious. They just think the fundamental particles it's made up of are conscious, right? So, so my, my question is stupid to, 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 sure to, to ask, like, for example, if I have one out of 10, the feel of myself, uh, feeling like to be DS, so it's uh, ten. So feeling like to be a fly bugging on the window, it maybe it's one. So it's this question is stupid to, to ask. No, um, I mean for a start, a fly is is still a pretty incredibly complicated thing, right? Um, maybe we want to think about what a bed bug or an electron maybe might be one. So yeah, I mean, how do we construct a scale? We there are mathematical ways of trying to be more precise about how much consciousness something has. And I'm is quite it something in- that we can measure? Um, so I'm, I am quite interested in the, the integrated information theory, which is so one of the science. So we've got a, we've got a, I think it's important to distinguish the scientific and the philosophical questions. The scientific question is which kinds of physical activity go along with consciousness. The philosophical question is, why? In terms of the scientific question, I'm quite interested in the integrated information. I didn't understand where we draw Mm. the line between the scientific and the philosophical thinking here. So we've already talked about two philosophical theories, right? We didn't give a name to it, but the more more, um, commonly held view materialism is that it's the physics it's physics that's fundamental right and consciousness somehow comes out of that whereas my view the panpsychist view turns that on its head it's consciousness that's fundamental the physical world arise rises from that they're two philosophical views you're not going to distinguish between them with an experiment right this is this is not the case in fact, and you know, so any scientific because theory, you cannot do an experiment for what you are presenting, right? Because I think this is a this is a philosophical rather than a scientific question. I mean, I in many ways, I think the religion of our times is scientism, the view that the only way to find out about reality is through experiments, and 
I think that that view is scientism is is, is quite clearly false because there's lot there's lots of experiments are hugely important, but there's lots of things we know independently of experiments like mathematics. There's no experiment that proves that two plus two is four. Or think about ethics. I think most people think you know you shouldn't torture people for fun. There's no experiment that proves that. There's not like peer-reviewed scientific experiment. We've proved that you shouldn't torture. So I think we I, again. I think this is the product of um being blown away with how successful science is, and it's understandable. But it's it's making us think that experiments are the only way of establishing anything. And in terms of this questions about consciousness, these fundamental philosophical questions of how consciousness and the physical world fit together. Is it is it the physical world that's first and consciousness comes out of it? Is it consciousness that's first and the physical world comes out? These are not scientific questions and they can't be established. They can't be decided upon by experiments. Any experiment you do cannot... Each theory will just interpret it in their own way. That, that there's no way of um, deciding between them with an experiment. Um, so because you you are not you are proposing exactly the opposite thing that you cannot prove everything with experiments. So basically, what you are uh, proposing cannot kind of have experiments because everything emerged from consciousness. Mm. So you cannot experiment, or, or you still can do experiments to find out if what you're saying is true. I don't think you can do experiments to find out what I'm saying is true, but nor do I think you can do experiments to find out if my opponents, the materialists, are true. So, like, take one example. Interest, right? Interesting. I'll come back to what I'm, a good argument. <laughs> come back to come back to my um, my friend and philosophical enemy, Anil Seth. Right, this neuroscientist. Uh, you know, I read when he came on my podcast, Mind Chat. Yeah. Yes. Plug for the oh, your podcast with the. Lowest production values and the best philosophy, <laughs> uh, apart from your own, uh, in terms of the good philosophy. Um, I forgot what I'm talking about now. Uh, you are talking about your Anil enemy. Set, right, my, my frenemy. So, you know, I read his, his wonderful book, Being You, and um, about his excellent work in the science of consciousness. And I just, I agree with all of it, apart from where he adds, oh, and by the way, I'm a materialist. So like, you know, take one hypothesis he gives you know, he thinks um, consciousness corresponds to predictive processing in the brain. Or take the integrated information theory that consciousness goes along with um, maximal integrated information. Well, there are all these proposals, right? The materialist is going to say, give one explanation of that. They're going to. I'm sure the viewers are more um, clever than me. And they probably I'm, I'm, understood uh, this, but I didn't understand. But so, so, <laughs> I mean, we we have a similar. Let, let's put it this way: we have a similar issue in um, quantum mechanics, right? Quantum mechanics is our best scientific theory. The predictions are very, very well confirmed. All of our technology is based on quantum mechanics. As opposed to general relativity, I think it's only GPS that's based on general relativity, but everything is dependent on quantum mechanics. The problem is no one knows what the hell that theory is telling us about reality. The equations are solid. The maths is solid. The math is solid. Uh, just translating into American there. But there are these different theories of, of what, what, what the maths is telling us, these different interpretations. And you can't do an experiment um, that can be slightly qualified, but it's very hard to do an experiment to distinguish between these. Similarly, neuroscientists are engaged in this process of which brain activity goes along with which kind of experience. So forget these complicated theories. Let's just say we discovered brain state X goes along with pain, right? Brain state X goes with pain. The scientists tell us that. We've discovered, right? Well, then the materialist will say, oh, well, that's because brain say X produces pain. The panpsychist will say, well, that's because that's the other way around. Brain state X comes from pain and every, all of the brain ultimately comes from more fundamental facts of consciousness. Any scientific fact you discover is compatible with these two views. One more analogy for good measure. Imagine a, a, a physicist who believes in God 
and a physicist who is an atheist. Their science is going to be totally the same, but they have different understandings of why the universe exists. Um, one thinks it was created by God, another thinks it's just a brute fact, but the science is going to be the same. And so, so we just need to appreciate that Look, I don't don't get me wrong, science is crucial for understanding consciousness, but there is a fundamental philosophical problem at the root here, what's traditionally been called the mind-body problem. How does consciousness and the physical world fit together? Is the physical world fundamental? Is consciousness fundamental? Are they both fundamental? And this is a philosophical, not a scientific problem. And we just have to take each of the views analyze them on their own terms and try to work out which is more likely to be true. So for me to rephrase what you're saying to see if I understood. So physicalists believe that the physical world, it's everything that we see around us and consciousness emerge from this world. Yeah. Like, uh, but you believe that all the stuff that we see around us, em- Consci- they, they, they are made from consciousness. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So, Ultimately. okay. So, very simple. So, I, I finally understood. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not, I, I understood. should have started with that. <laughs> so, okay, interesting. So, uh, now, so there is physicalist, panpsychist, and there is another idea recently coming in the <laughs> in the conversation with Donald Hoffman, mm. uh, what he's presenting. Yeah. So can you explain what he's presenting and where it fits with yeah. these two ideas? Yeah, well, I'm good friends with Donald Hoffman I'll, and uh, we've had some very long conversations that with an Annika Harris's audio series she's producing that should emerge at some point. And... Um, I emerge mean, <laughs> but yeah <laughs> very <funny>. good <laughs> or maybe it's fundamental um having a conference on panpsychism in new york in september and donald is speaking there so so this well let me start with this the sim this and i love i love donald's view you know have some disagreements but it's really interesting work the similarity is we both think consciousness is fundamental and that's that that's what's going on at base right and so I think that's really a very important point of commonality. I guess where I part company from... Can you explain his theory first before you take it apart? Well, maybe I can just add the bit I disagree with and that fills out the theory in a way. He has this stuff that the physical world is in some way illusory or not real, that it's just... He has this analogy to icons on a computer screen, you know, that... There isn't, if you're looking at an image of a car in a computer game, you know, there isn't really a car in front of you. It's just an image or something. Um, And so I think, whereas he would say, I mean, his view, right, is what philosophers have called for hundreds of years, idealism. Um, So these are the three kind of uh, main ideas, idealism, panpsychism, and uh, materialism. Well... There's also, we haven't mentioned dualism. I don't know if you want to get that. Um, they're both the physical world and consciousness are fundamental. This was the view of René Descartes, for example. And I guess this is probably perhaps the most intuitive view and one that it probably in all cultures in history has dominated that consciousness is in the soul and that's somehow distinct from the body and the brain. Um, often, so w- what religions basically are saying? I think many. W- w- by, by the way, guys, yeah. Yeah, because I feel this as well. Like, these topics are the most complicated, difficult topics. So even yeah. that we can't even talk about it, and understand it. So it's a pleasure. So <laughs> if you don't understand some things like I do, don't feel too much pressure yeah <laughs> it's the these are the most difficult philosophical Absolutely. problems nobody knows <laughs> what they're talking about on this topic so uh we're still everyone's still just struggling to get to the baseline i mean yeah i think actually i think we're not even at first base with consciousness that's the problem we're not even thinking about it in the right way but um yeah so 
Lots of religions have been dualistic, I think, thinking consciousness is separate from the body and the brain. But there are also, in contemporary philosophy, so-called naturalistic dualists. So David Chalmers, one of the most well-known philosophers of consciousness, he calls himself a naturalistic dualist because he thinks consciousness is not physical. It's different from the body or the brain. But he wants to bring it into the scientific story. He postulates these special laws of nature that connect the brain to consciousness both ways, uh, that consciousness can impact the brain and the brain can impact consciousness. And he ultimately hopes that we'll just be able to establish scientific laws that determine that law-governed activity. So he believes that um, uh, the spirit and consciousness is somewhere else. Um... Well, it's 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 closely connected with the brain and it 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 appears so he just thinks there are these special principles of nature that determine that when you get certain brain activity, consciousness pops up. But consciousness is totally separate, but it's it's connected to the physical world very tightly by these laws of nature that Chalmers calls psychophysical laws. Um does that kind of make sense? Yes, so basically it's combining the two things that you yeah. were saying. So physicalist, uh, panpsychist, and he's kind of in the middle. Of yeah, so I would, he, that, He's presenting that it's kind of half, uh, it, maybe it's both it's together. Both. It's like, both. So look, and it's, it's yeah. not one way that, uh, first and the other way around. It's kind of both together. Exactly. So I think, look, there's roughly speaking three options here. The physical world is fundamental, consciousness pops out of that. Or consciousness is fundamental, and the physical world pops out of that. I would put panpsychism and idealism both very, very close there. Or they're both fundamental, and they're, clo they're closely entwined. Um, Descartes famously said, we're not like people driving a ship. We're, we're more closely entwined with our bodies and brains, but they're still separate, closely entwined, but distinct. So we've just got to, there's no experiment that can tell you which of these is correct, sadly. We've just got to do some philosophy and ex examine each, op each theory on its own terms. What if consciousness is fundamental then? What you are presenting, what we are going to do differently, how we should go about it? Like if I give you one trillion dollars now, where do you spend it for research? And what do we do about it if you are right in your claims? Right, so yeah, so, so firstly, you know, I don't think... By the way, do you want one trillion dollars? Say again. Do you want one trillion dollars? I don't. I'm happy to take it off your hands if you. <laughs> yeah. If you if you need someone to give it to, I can. Um, yeah. I've just I've just won some money to uh, spend three years trying to work out if the universe is conscious. So I'm. Uh, but I could always use some more because you know I've only got three. It might take a bit more than three years. So you can top it up if you want. Um, what am I talking about? You, you yeah, are look, talking. I, 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 you know, I often say to my students, philosophy is pointless, but <laughs> some of the most important things in the world are pointless, right? We don't want everything. This is a problem with universities now, right? This this sort of marketization of universities that it's all about what's practical or good for the economy or building bridges or curing disease. That's all crucial, but... What about art? What about culture? What about the noble tasks? What about of, love? What about love? <laughs> Smile of a baby. I, I I like love. I was in love once. No, I still am in love. Uh, with my beautiful wife. We, we believed that that you were you were in the love once <laughs> for your wife not to see that. <laughs> sort of corrected myself very quickly. Uh, she won't watch this. She's got long bored of watching podcasts I've been on. Should we watch the podcast? No. <laughs> I've got better better things to do with my the small amount of spare time I have with children. Anyway. So the question the question uh, Oh yeah. What's the what's the sorry. The, what's the point? Yeah, so there's a noble human task of trying to have our best guess at what reality is, what this world is that we live in. And it 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 might not have any practical implications, but I think it's 
a crucial part of being human that we have some people doing this and thinking about this. And so that's one thing to say. I think, as I say, like that in terms of the basic day-to-day -day science, it might not make any difference, but... Well, uh, Donald Hoffman is presenting that if we put more effort to those uh, that f consciousness is the fundamental thing, we can do new science and we can do uh, maybe teleporting if we understand the fundamentals of that. So I'm asking kind of with what you're presenting, what type of stuff we might be able to... Yeah, so that's what I was going to go on to say. The I always just want to say, firstly, we shouldn't measure everything by, you know, um, how many how many bridges it builds, how much, you know, we shouldn't be a oh. nation of shopkeepers. Yes. But... That was my question. Having, I'm sorry, I'm of the stupid... <laughs> yeah, don't be silly, don't be silly. It's a, it's, an, it's, it's a natural question to ask and it, and it allows me to give that first answer. But secondly, I actually do think that there are um, important interactions with the science uh, in terms of, I, I think how we how we uh, think of the philosophy can influence the science and the other way around. Even though I said they're different, they're, so my my in, my motive my attraction to the integrated information theory, one particular scientific theory of consciousness, is partly for philosophical reasons, which we could perhaps talk about, and well, you know, working out which things are conscious is absolutely crucial um, ethically, right? If we have people with a locked-in syndrome, people we can't communicate with, trying to assess whether they are still conscious um, is absolutely crucial. And, you know, we've developed recently uh, the capacity to actually communicate with people who have locked-in syndrome in certain cases. What's locked-in syndrome? So people who are paralyzed in a deep coma and uh, not paralyzed, sorry, in a deep coma and can't actually talk. Oh, and, to, and we can't communicate with it. So scientists, I mean, uh, oh my God. about a decade ago now, um, let me remember the details now. We ask these people yes or no questions. So we don't know, you know, we, we, we try to talk to them. We don't know if they can hear, we don't know. So we ask them yes or no questions. And we say to them, uh, if you want to answer yes, think about playing tennis. Think about your most energetic thing. If we want to answer no, think about... Wow. Um, I could, now, I can't remember. A bit sketch of the details. Now, maybe think about, you know, lying in front of a nice fire. And we examine with a brain scanner, you know, uh, with fMRI, whether the motor part of the brain is stimulated and or, or whether... Um, so they were able to communicate. So they were able to actually get, yes, yeah, so, and establish, oh my God, this person is totally uh, conscious and totally rational and understanding they just can't do anything so that's one crucial implication yeah. i mean also another crucial implication is um wow. whether whether wow. i mean one big philosophical fight is whether consciousness is to do with the specific biological stuff of the brain you know the flesh and blood or whether it's something more computational to do with organization to do with you know so whether it's hardware or software right People sometimes say wet word because the brain is sort of You need to mushy. explain that a bit more. So hardware, me. right? So take, uh, you know, Microsoft Word is software, right? You could run Microsoft Word on your laptop, oh, no, on I your understand. PC. So the laptop, the PC, the phone, that's different hardware, right? So is my consciousness to do with the specific... Is, is my consciousness a phone or is my consciousness I, the iOS inside, the software yeah, inside? exactly, exactly. Uh, this is crucial. I mean, one interesting question, could we ever upload our consciousness, right? Maybe one day in the future, you'll be able to upload your mind onto a onto the internet and you can, you know, communicate with granny when she's, when her body's rotted away through email. Uh, but now if conscious, that depends whether consciousness is computational or to do with the flesh and blood stuff. Because if it's to do with the flesh and blood stuff, then we, this this leads to a horrific dystopian scenario that we're all uploading our consciousness and we're just destroying our consciousness, thinking it's uploaded and the information is there, the computational stuff, but there's no longer consciousness. And we think we're living in this utopia. But so we're zombies. This is Zombies, that's the, uh, yeah, the, the, the philosophical zombie is something that's behaviorally 
in some sense just like a conscious being so if we, if it's hard to wear if we are phones then we are zombies uh and if it's software what else we're it's, not if it's hardware and we upload our brains then we're killing our consciousness and we're making ourselves zombies right so yeah i mean another way of getting at the difference imagine one day we can let's say one day we can build a silicon robot that behaves just like you right silicon vidious and all the information processing in the brain is the same and it can talk about its interest in consciousness and say oh i don't get that and oh that's really interesting um is that thing conscious well, maybe, maybe if consciousness is to do with computation, yeah, it's conscious because it's running all the same computations. But if consci- maybe consciousness is dependent on the, 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 the flesh and blood and a silicon thing isn't conscious, in which case it's, it's, not re- it's, it's just a complicated, unfeeling mechanism. So these are, you know, there are crucial practical questions, medical it, questions. It's crazy. Mm. <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> so if we are able to upload our brains and it's the right way so we're not philosophical brains actually we can live forever yeah yeah well that's <laughs> that's one that that's one implication so i'm probably on the side that thinks you couldn't upload your brains you couldn't, you couldn't upload, upload it. it but um but yeah i mean look this is obviously it's not so pressing an issue right now with technology right now but uh yeah maybe we could all upload and live better lives on you know we can get rid of some people think i had one of my students writing the dissertation on this that we need this is should be the fundamental priority of humanity give a quick shout out to joe gelman that you know developing uh, yes, they, they, we can get and rid of scarcity. Things. You know, this is what. Sorry, <laughs> we're putting celebrating FS. <laughs> All right, <laughs> good idea. Yeah, that worked well. Um, you know, we can we can get rid of scarcity. We can give everyone what they want. We can have this utopia where we all live online, our consciousness uploaded, and um, but I think we'd be killing ourselves. <laughs> yeah. You think uh, you will be killing ourselves because we are we will be all philosophical zombies without actual consciousness. Yeah, I think we would be getting rid of our consciousness, and I think consciousness is what makes us us, and what makes human life worth living. So this is—I mean, this isn't just an abstract puzzle. This is—I uh, mean, I'm inclined to think our current scientific worldview, which is materialist, physicalist, is actually inconsistent with the reality of consciousness. And so we're going through a strange period of history at the moment where our official scientific worldview denies the reality of the thing that's most obvious, like your own feelings, and the thing that makes life worth living. And I do think that has an impact on people, whether they sort of think about it or not can lead to a sense of alienation, a sense that we don't fit into the world. Max Weber called this the disenchantment of nature. Whereas panpsychism is a worldview that it can accommodate both the scientific truth, but also the human truth, the reality of our own feelings and experiences. And so, yeah, I think I always say, we should be thinking not about the view we'd like to be true, but the, the view that's most likely to be true. But I think panpsychism, the great thing is it's, I think there's good reason to think it's probably true, but it's also a bit better for our, our ment- well-being, mental and spiritual health. Interesting. Yeah. I also think it gives right a, a better connection to the environment. You know, I'm, anyway. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, no, no, I'm curious to, to talk hmm. more about that, but I, I just had one funny thought. So if I ever meet an alien, I will not. I will not be sure that he is conscious. Exactly, because yeah, exactly. he might be a fucking philosophical zombie, <laughs> and I will not understand. He might just be able to pass the Turing test, and he's just a, a machine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, this is you get into the heart of the challenge now, which I think is consciousness is not publicly observable. You can't. And that's what makes it different to any other scientific question. Science talks about things you can't see, right? Like particles. 
but it's only talking about those things to explain what we can see. Science is all about public observation, public experiment. But in the case of consciousness, the thing we're trying to explain is not observable. And so, yeah, if you have this alien, you know, you you could look in its brain, you could see how it works, you could work out how it processes information and how that leads to its... But you'd still have the question, does it have an inner life? And But if we take panpsychism, we might be able to understand if or, or we might not be able I mean, to understand are we going to appear? even then because like not all panpsychists yes. think that so the basic idea is the basic building blocks are conscious but maybe not all arrangements so maybe your socks aren't conscious they're just made up of little things that are conscious so we've still got the question when do those um, no, we're not going to have the question, am I right? Because we're going to be sure that he is uh, conscious. Why? If we, uh, if we have the view that you are presenting, because he's going to be emerging from the co uh, consciousness. So he will have a form of consciousness. So his body and his brain will emerge from little conscious things. But... It doesn't follow, I don't think, maybe you disagree, that the whole thing has its own consciousness. But he might to, his cells, his cells maybe, will, yeah, might. Maybe, yeah. So, oh. so it could be, yeah, this cup is made up of little conscious things. So it's, yeah, the cup emerges from consciousness in that sense. But it doesn't mean the cup has its, has own, its con own consciousness. consciousness. Uh, so, I think now we're getting to the heart of the of bit of the hmm. understanding of your view. Yeah. So how do we know? It's a very deep question, and I think all we can do is we can. It's a scientific question. We start in our own case, and scan brains, and you can often like you can actually stimulate bits of the brain and ask people what you felt, and then we try to move beyond the human case to creatures that are similar to us, and but. It's very different and it's very difficult, sorry. And there are so many different theories and so little consensus. It's, it is a really deep problem. Um, I mean, one thing that could make a difference is whether consciousness makes a difference when it pops up. I think, I mean, I argue with, I've argued a lot with the scientist, um, Sean Carroll. Oh, I'm good. I'm going to be debating Sean Carroll in September in New York. We've we've had a couple of debates on each other's podcasts. Did I mention my podcast Mind Chat? Yes. Yeah. Um, but we're going to put it again here. <laughs> that's, that's the last time. Um, we're going to be debating about. So Sean Carroll thinks you know physics runs the show. Uh, you know the equations of physics determine absolutely everything that happens in my body and my brain. Um. And that's like a very common view, you know, that's very, I, I, I don't think we've got any reason to think, to accept that view. I, th I mean, the, the, the experiments on which we base our physics are usually based on like very small numbers of particles and our understanding of the brain is still at a very early stage. So I don't think we have any good reason really to think that everything that happens in the brain can be explained in terms of underlying chemistry and physics. So it could be that when you get something with its own consciousness, it starts to, as it were, override the laws of physics. It behaves a bit differently. I think, I mean, it's sort of arguing my new book, actually, we've got very good reason on philosophical grounds to think that's true. And that would make the project much easier because then when we're looking at our alien, we see actually its brain isn't quite following physics. It's doing something a bit different, a bit random. <laughs> and um, and that might be a marker of consciousness. So does that make sense? If, if they, yeah. yeah. I think so. I can, I can rephrase to, to see yeah. if I understood. So we have our zombie, we have it here. Uh, no, not zombie, our alien friend. We have it here. We see it oh, on yeah. the screen. Hello. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, we see him, but he might uh, might not have consciousness, but my, his all his cells might be having consciousness, and might he might be uh, he might 
by all his cells having consciousness doesn't mean that the whole thing itself has its own awareness. Yeah. So this is kind of what you are, the panpsychist view is. Yeah. So we're not sure if he uh, yeah. whole self has consciousness, but we're sure that his own cells has consciousness. Yeah. Or the small, the smallest or the small parts of it. But well, that was my pessimistic worry. But I'm now suggesting possible optimism that it could be that when a system has its own consciousness, it behaves differently. Um, so when you have a system, so it could be that when you have a system, maybe this cup doesn't have consciousness. It's made up of conscious things, but it, maybe when you have that kind of situation, it's just physics and you can predict what's going to happen just from running the equations of physics. But maybe, let's say my phone is conscious, Maybe it ha when it has its own consciousness, that it starts to behave a bit differently, and you couldn't predict what it's doing just from the physics. Okay. Now that is very. We're nowhere near being able to. As people think, you know, people have think science is further than it is. We are nowhere near. Like, take the brain, right? Do you know it's snowing by the way out there? Oh it's wow! It's beautiful. We're we're in the far north of England at the moment. This yes. is the. Uh, so romantic it's beautiful <laughs> we're talking about cry. philosophical zombies here <laughs> and there is <laughs> I don't know if the snow is conscious each snowflake is unique isn't it? but I don't know whether that means it has its own experience <laughs> so anyway, we're putting uh, we're putting snow as well to us in the screen for you guys to oh, see <laughs> feel the feeling of romanticism <laughs> my two year old saw real snow for the first time last week Oh, really? The hell is this? <laughs> she was a bit scared. Um, what were we talking about? Yeah, so... Uh, Talk about... You were are, you are talking about in, uh, in your book, you are presenting a more optimistic view about that yeah, we so, can find, actually, if oh, it's yeah, conscious. Talk, so in the brain, you know, we, we know... People think... In your new think, book that will come in November. Oh, yeah. I think... I think people think we know more about the brain than we do. I, you know, we we know how the basic chemistry, we know how neurons fire and um, neurotransmitters and, the, you know, the basic chemistry. We also know quite a bit about how big bits of the brain work. What we're almost clueless on is how, it's kind of the mechanics of it, how the basic chemistry connects with the large scale functions. So like we know the top and the bottom, but we don't know about the middle. Um, but best book I read on this was uh, Matthew Cobb's book, uh, The Idea of the Brain, you know, which, which really a wonderful intellectual history of the brain, but really how little we know. So I, I, I don't think we have any reason to think that when, so my view is that when consciousness emerges, it makes a difference. So you couldn't predict what my brain is doing just from the physics. So that's where I disagree with Sean Carroll. He thinks in principle, obviously no one can do this, but in principle, uh, if you just knew the physics, you could work out exactly what's going on in my brain. Uh, I don't agree with that. I mean, one reason I don't agree with that is I think it, it becomes a mystery then why consciousness evolved. Because like natural selection just cares about behavior, right? Just cares about what we do, you know, escaping from tigers and, you know, mating and everything. But if if we could, there could have been a mechanism that could have done all the same stuff, then natural selection wouldn't. Natural selection doesn't care about whether you have consciousness. It just cares that you're doing the right stuff. You're behaving in a way that's going to be good for your survival. So there could have just been mechanisms that did that, right? Interesting. In which case, why aren't why why aren't we zombies? Why did we evolve with consciousness? Whereas if, on my view, consciousness makes a difference when it pops up it kind of overrides the laws of physics, things behave a bit differently, then we can sort of make sense of why we evolve consciousness because it makes a behavioral difference. And if that's right, then maybe in a hundred years time when we understand the brain better, we can start to see, ah, look, this is where physics gets overridden. This is where, and this is where consciousness emerges at the higher level. So I think that's what's going to happen actually. So uh, about the... Uh, op optimistic uh, view that you were talking about. Tell tell me a bit more about the things that you uh, about your book that you wrote and mm. what is the type of insight 
the ideas that you are presenting because this is some stuff that you're presenting in your book, right? As I understood. Yeah, so I got this new book coming out in November called Why? The Purpose of the Universe. Um, Why? And I, so this is, it's not just on consciousness. It's, um, it's not only on panpsychism. It's not only on panpsychism. <laughs> you might see it as a kind of a middle way between God and atheism. I think, no, I, ha- I always hate the dichotomies. You know, you, you're, you're a sort of US capitalist or a Soviet communist or you, you know, you like Richard Dawkins or you like the Pope. You know? I hate the dichotomy. <laughs> and you know, I find if, you're, if, you're, if you're talking to people at a party or something, I like to bore people with philosophy, you know, and people are always trying to get you, which, which side are you on, you know, are you? Um, but I, I come to think that I think there's certain things religious people, religious believers can't explain, like the, why is there so much suffering? You know, why, why would a loving, all-powerful God create a universe with, create a world with earthquakes and hurricanes and, you know, and there are, and nature's full of, full of such cruelty. You know, there's a kind of shrew that uh, paralyzes its prey, but it doesn't kill them. Yes, and we're going they, to put a picture of this, a video yeah, play now. It's kind of crazy. I'll I'll find <laughs> I'll find the name of the of the animal. And then it it just eats its prey alive over several days until it just the, the prey just dies of its injury. You know, why would a loving God create that true? You know? So I think there's things religious, traditional religious people can't explain. But I also think there's things traditional atheists can't explain. Uh, so one thing I focus on, I mean, this what we just talked about with the evolution of consciousness, but also um, what's called the, the fine-tuning of physics for life. So the surprising discovery of the last few decades that for life to be possible in our universe, certain numbers had to fall, certain numbers in physics had to fall in a quite precise range Um so, I mean, one example of this is the expansion of the universe. So we discovered in the 1990s that the universe is accelerating in, in its expansion. So as physicists postulate... So I'm getting taller. Uh, are you? Does that mean you're getting taller? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so, because uh, space itself is expanding. Uh, maybe that means you're getting smaller relative to the universe. I don't know. Oh, because it's re- relati- relativistic. This is kind of like it. Uh, <laughs> ask a physicist. I don't think that means you get it told. But anyway, <laughs> the universe. They, so they physicists postulate. <laughs> That's a question I cannot answer. I have to just hold my hand. Um, I ask so good questions. <laughs> that you... <laughs> it's a good question. It's got me thinking. Um, philosophy. Sorry, physicists postulate a repulsive force. That's pushing apart the universe. They, this is what's called dark energy. Now, if that force had been, let me get this the right way around. If that force had been a little bit stronger, everything would have shot apart so quickly that no two particles would have ever met. Nothing would have clumped together to make stars and planets. We wouldn't have had any structural complexity. So, but if it, but if that force had been a little bit uh, weaker then gravity it would have added to gravity and gravity would have caused the universe to collapse back on itself black in a hole? split second or it's um, different. would it have been a black hole I'm not sure if it would have been a black hole but it would have everything would have collapsed back on itself so so I that, was going to be smaller th- definitely th- this there, force shorter. yeah this force <laughs> had to be exactly right if it was you know a little bit stronger Nothing would have, we wouldn't have had stars or planets. If it had been a bit weaker, the universe would have been over in a split second. And it looks so it incredibly was improbable. The right exactly. balance. Incredibly improbable that the number would be in that precise rate. And there are numbers like this, I could give you more examples, all the way through physics. And so look, we we face a choice. Either it's just incredible fluke that those numbers happen to be exactly right for life which just seems to me 
crazy thing to think, it's too improbable, or the numbers are right for life because they are the right numbers for life, that there is some kind of goal-directedness in the early universe, that the universe in some way was aiming at the emergence of life God. and consciousness. So, well, that's what people <laughs> tend to say, right? That's the, that's the natural, but I don't like God either. So, <laughs> so My father is a priest, I'm going to warn you. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no, I, it is, he is a priest, but... <laughs> don't tell him. Does he watch the podcast? And he doesn't know English, so right. He speaks Greek, okay. So we're Which safe. He, he doesn't have to know. <laughs> uh, was that Catholic or oh, Christian Orthodox? Right, right. Of course, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I don't, I don't like either of the. You're supposed to fit into one of these categories. I don't like either of them, and so I'm exp- exploring a range of hypotheses in the middle ground. So, so, so roughly I explore three hypotheses. One is maybe a designer that's not God. Like, so God is supposed to be all knowing, all powerful, perfectly good. Maybe there's a designer who's not all powerful. Maybe this is the best universe they could create. Or maybe it's a bad designer. Or maybe we live in a computer simulation that was just created by some random scientist. So that's one possibility. Or maybe you don't need a designer at all. Maybe there are just natural tendencies in the universe towards certain goals. So Aristotle, the philosopher, ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, dominated uh, European thought for hundreds of years. And he he believed that there were natural tendencies. So he thought fire goes up because it's trying to get to its natural place in the heavens. Earth goes down because it's trying to get to its natural place in the center of the universe. We don't believe that anymore, but it seems coherent that there could be just natural tendencies towards the emergence of certain goals like life or conscious awareness. Oh, the third possibility I consider, which is probably my favorite, is cosmopsychism, that the universe itself is conscious and has certain goals. So, yeah, so... I mean, it sounds crazy and no, I feel it, silly it, defending it, 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 but it, I think... It doesn't sound crazy, no? actually, because I consider, for example, when I am conscious, when I I think my country is conscious in a way because we are a lot of people together. It, mm. might, be, it might be something there because we are all whether with the same goals or whatever. It's a yep. group of people, super intelligence or whatever. That I don't know, maybe there is something to feel like... Uh, uh, my country. I don't know. Maybe I'm stupid. Yeah. But no. I no. think uh, everything kind of if a structure might have. So I don't think it's actually stupid for the whole universe, the cosmos, to yeah. have its own. Uh, so if 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 there is a consciousness in the cosmos, there might be a more cosmos and more whatever stuff. I don't know what. Can you can you walk me through thoughts, random thoughts about this topic to take it a bit further? To <laughs> yeah, no, you just reminded me of when I was young. I mean, I I was raised Catholic actually, and uh, my my dad's hero was uh, Pierre <laughs> Teilhard de Jardin, who was uh, a paleontologist and heretical Catholic priest. Actually, he was. I think after he died, the church decided he wasn't heretical, but they weren't very nice to him when he was alive. But this was a time, late 19th century, early 20th century, where um, the church wasn't sure what to think about evolution. But still, they're not sure. (laughs) Tyler Jordan was inspired by it. He had this idea of an evolving universe, you know, that's evolving to... And he had this... Some people think he predicted the internet because uh, he had this idea that the next stage of cosmic evolution. So he thought, you know, life and self-awareness and reason have been these big jumps in cosmic evolution. And the next stage is going to come from us all being informationally connected up via YouTube and the internet and um, some new form of life and consciousness will emerge from that. And he thought this was all going towards what he called the omega point where the universe will sort of become one with God or something. Anyway... I don't know if that's true, but I like it. Uh, but yeah, cosmopsychism. So, so we so far we've been talking about panpsychism, like little particles are conscious. 
But actually, many theoretical physicists are, are inclined to think the basic constituents of reality are not particles, but fields, universe-wide fields. And particles are just local vibrations in fields. So if you combine that view with panpsychism, you get the view that the fundamental forms of consciousness are these universe-wide fields. And in some sense, the fundamental mind is the universe itself. So it's, that's, I think, a very attractive form of panpsychism. And then if you then bring in this fine-tuning business that there seems to be this goal-directedness towards life, then that fits very well. If it's a conscious, the universe is conscious, then maybe it has certain goals, certain aims. This is your job as a philosopher. Mm. This is exactly your job to present ideas to the world. What is uh, the job of a philosopher? Um, well, I, I'm employed by a university and I guess the the idea of a university professor is, is not just teaching, that's an important part of the job, but it's also being an active practitioner of the field, publishing, doing scholarship, writing books and articles, and ideally getting that across to a broader audience. But yeah, so that's that's the way I suppose we get to pay people to do philosophy. Uh, some people can make a living from philosophy outside of academia, but generally, if you're going to make a living from philosophy, you're employed by a university. So, I, yeah, I mean, that's coming back to the point of a university. I worry that we get to the point of thinking it's just teaching people how to be good citizens and help the economy. I think universities are supposed to be a seats of learning and for its own sake. And, um, and you think we went I'm, away from that? Very much so, yeah. Increasingly, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's got, it's got worse, actually, since we started paying for education in the UK. I was the last year of free education in the UK. So now students pay, uh, not as much as in the States, but, but <laughs> then it changes it's the relationship ridiculous. because it's like it's a customer now and the client and the whole language changes and the people at the top of the university think they're CEOs and they're on, you know, half a million or whatever. And are we? And I think, it, yeah, I think we have this thing that actually Tony Blair brought in called Impact with a capital I. And the idea is that all uh, university departments have to prove that they're practically adding to society. And, um, and that's not, in a way, that can be a good thing. But it depends how you measure. One thing, you're not allowed to do, you're not allowed to say it by how you help your local community, like Durham here. We've got to, it's got to be that you're changing the country or ideally the world. Wouldn't it be wonderful, right, if all these universities were incentivized to give back to their direct community and, you know, connect to the community? And um, so, yeah, I think... So we remove payment out of the interaction and you think we have a better educational system? That's not a, that's a part of it, but I think, um, like I think, I mean, I think after the second world war, after the horrors of the two wars, we decided to have a very different society. Uh, we, in the UK and the US, we put very high taxes on the wealthy. The average rate of tax in the UK on the wealthy was 89% between 1939 and 1980, I think. Interesting. In the US was 81%. And it worked. Society became much more equal. Uh, and it, it was good for the economy. It, it, this is called the golden age of capitalism. Um, and I think we started to develop a society that was not just totally dominated by market values was more more of a compromise it wasn't so it wasn't communism it was a sort of mixed economy a compromise of market in some places but some places democracy decides how we're going to run things and i th i think it that went pretty well it wasn't perfect 
but it, it it went it went pretty well and then you know my parents generation came out of that and they i think they were the luckiest generation that ever lived then from the 80s we decided we're gonna have wild west capitalism we you know shredded taxes shredded regulation massive inequality 2008 the world collapsed and then we've been living with the bullshit ever since of uh, Trump and Brexit and everything, everything that's fallen out of that, as that model of Wild West capitalism has imploded, people don't know what the hell is going on and we're still seeking around for something new. So I think we need to go back to not, not throwing away capitalism overnight, but deciding that d democratically we're going to uh, not let the market dominate all parts of life, including universities. We could, you know. With a different methods, you're not suggesting like specific things. You're like suggesting the idea of going back to these principles. That well, there are very Might be like universal basic income or the yeah. different things, but you're just presenting this idea. Yeah, I mean there were there were problems with the old system in many ways, but the, the and there are, I mean very specific proposals people might like um, the, the the French economist Thomas Piketty, uh, whose recent book um, A History of Equality is a short, he's written some very big books, but that's a more manageable book. Do you recommend uh, it? Yeah, yeah, and the final chapter that's very specific proposals. He, he proposes, for example, a universal inheritance so that we have a very high wealth tax and we give each person on their 21st birthday an inheritance of 60% of average wealth. So that what, what does everybody, that mean? Uh, and, so you just give, you just give, so the way, like now the way we have it, right? We're supposed to believe in equality of opportunity, but some people start off in life with a huge sum of money because they inherit it from wealthy parents, whereas yes. other people have nothing. That's not equality of opportunity. So he's saying, let we can give everyone an inheritance. How we 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 give very high wealth taxes on uh, the wealthy, and we on ev every single citizen on their twenty first birthday, we we'll give them like fifty thousand or twenty thousand yeah. dollars, and they yeah. Do all the kickstart of their end, careers. Did it end up 120,000 euros? I could, I'll have to check the figures, but um, yeah. That's an interesting idea. And he's got lots of... Pro so he calls it a, a sort of decommodification of the economy. So I mean, like, I think one problem with like, you know, one of the many, many problems with the Soviet system was just like, overnight, we're going to get rid of capital. You know, I think we need to have an evolution rather than revolution. We need to... Piketty calls it decommodify the economy. Say, look, we'll take the market out of healthcare. We'll take we'll, we'll take market out of entertainment. I mean, it's less and less. It makes less and less sense these days to have capitalism in entertainment because we can stream things so cheaply. We can so let's let's uh, you know we, we could have everything free at the point of delivery and pay people to be entertainers, maybe some competitive stuff and you could get a salary to, we could just, we could decide to do that. We could try it out. We could model it, you know, universal basic income. So taking control uh, with the whole Brexit thing in Britain a few years ago, I think the slogan was take back control. And I think that was the wrong target leaving the European Union, but people know things are not what they have. We're not controlling our destiny. We need, we do need to democratically take back control of society because it's basically, you know, a plaything for large corporations that dominate politics and the media and all the newspapers here owned by a small number of billionaires. And, you know, we do need to take back control. I love what you said. Uh, and I like how you said it because... We don't need to actually, we need to test different things, like mm. be open to test different ideas. Yeah. We're not saying like immediately let's change the society, let's br right. bring back communism, let's do this. Yeah. Let's have a small test of these things, Absolutely. let's do research about this topic, testing on a small scale. If it works, if you have good results, let's put it more, let's be more open-minded about what is it. And uh, in that, exactly right, and in that spirit, Think about the last 70 years. We had the 30 years after the war, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, were in Western Europe and the US. High taxes on the wealthy, strong trade unions, 
um, um, strong regulation, and it was very dynamic economy, and people uh, got society got massively more unequal for the first time in history. You know, most of history, um, almost everything has been owned by a tiny percentage. Europe in twenty, sorry, in nineteen thirteen. The top 10% owned 89% of everything, right? Uh, after the Second World War, you know, we did this and it worked. We had so much of the wealth that was, you know, captured by the top was spread out through the middle, at least. The bottom half didn't do that well. But, um, and then, but then the next 30 years, while West capitalism, it's been a fucking disaster, right? So compare those two periods. And I think there's a lot of uh, investment with people who don't want you to remember this, <laughs> you know, with the, the newspapers owned by a few billionaires, you know, the money in politics. You know, it's never talked about that we used to have these very high taxes and it worked. It was an incredibly dynamic economy. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> we've sort of moved on from consciousness. But I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> It. Uh, I, I was curious to ask you about what do you think about democracy. We're mo we moved. Uh, we're going to come oh, yeah. back to consciousness and to why I became vegetarian and all this stuff. But like, I'm curious. Uh, really quickly, tell me, do you think de democracy is the way to go? I think it's. I think it would be a very good idea if we had it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we had it, I think that. Well, I was quote, paraphrasing Gandhi. You know, Gandhi. Gandhi was famously asked, "What do you think of Western civilization?" And he said, "I think it would be a very good idea." <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I think we have democracy to a to a sign. You know, you shouldn't. <laughs> it's a good. It's a good line. I like Gandhi. Uh, you know, we we have fought for democracy and we do have democracy to a significant extent but it's a it's a work in progress and i think we need to democratize more of our more of our society you know that the the if you take a corporation it's still a dictatorship right the most people in the in the corporation don't get to choose what they're doing don't don't get to affect their destiny um we don't have real equality of opportunity while there's such huge inequality where some people are born very privileged, some people are born with almost nothing. Um, so I, it's about seeing d democracy. Democracy is about the people taking control of their destiny and their society. And that's more than just you choose between two parties every five years. It's about drop the mic <laughs> <laughs> in your community you know that we 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 run our communities we have um a, a stake and a say and there are different institutions for people having a stake in society and i think that's the problem at the moment people democracy is there's a lot of bad things happening things don't seem to be going well i don't think it's that democracy has failed it's that we didn't keep it moving and we went a bit backwards since the 80s. We need to give people a stake, a say. And you seem a bit pessimistic about that. <laughs> really? I'm trying to be optimistic. No, I think uh, things have... I, I think not pessimistic, but you have, you have definitely a harsh point of view of reality now of what we... Well, in a way, it's... Look, it's still great. We have, we have gone nowhere back. We've gone back... We haven't ugh, start that again. <laughs> We've gone nowhere near back to like what it was in 1913, where the you know the top 10 percent owned 89 percent in Europe. It was worse in in the, was it worse in the states? Actually, no. I think the states were a bit ahead of us then. Um, we haven't gone back that bad, but it's the direction of travel and things have started to go backwards since the 80s really and particularly when everything blew up after 2008 and we know that this you know in the 80s you could understand people thinking maybe this is going to work maybe if we cut taxes on the rich everyone will get richer and it'll be great maybe you know but we now know it hasn't worked especially since 2008 and which we need to move to the next stage and i think when you're between stages there's always this uncertainty period where people are you know, jump into extremes, Janet. So I think we, you know, I, I'm hopeful that I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll 
work our way towards a new understanding of, of, of what we're all about. So I, um, as I told you, I'm watching your videos online for two years now. And uh, I'm always curious to hear kind of a bit more about the person behind the theories and behind the ideas. So I'm curious to hear kind of how intense is your life, like of studying, of writing, of like, how, how, how do you manage to do also this public persona, the books right, in the university, kind of describing kind of the life behind of all these things do you have? Yeah, I suppose, it, I mean, in some ways, the academic life is it is quite monastic really that you're just spending a lot of time <laughs> writing and um i follow the great tradition of uh descartes churchill and the economist keynes and working in bed so i <laughs> i get up and you know i have a very strict routine but i write in the morning in bed horizontal and um <laughs> What horizontal? Oh, you lay back and you write on yeah. your computer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I do live these things out. It's not just an, as I say, it's not just an abstract puzzle. I mean, I mean, I talk a little bit in my book Galileo's Error about. I was tortured by the problem of consciousness for a long time. You know, I when I was at university. We didn't learn about panpsychism. Uh, we were taught either you think consciousness is something magical and mysterious, you know, or you just think it's materialism, physicalism, brain processes. Um, and I, I, I wanted to defend the scientific option. You know, I thought I was raised Catholic. I'd rejected that. I thought, you know, I don't believe in religious superstition. I'm going to go to the scientific option. But I eventually became persuaded that you cannot explain consciousness in those terms for some of the reasons we've been discussing. Uh, but I still didn't want to give up the view. So what I did then is I decided consciousness didn't really exist. <laughs> there was no such thing as consciousness. This is the view that some people defend now. Uh, illusionism. The view that the brain tricks us into thinking, thinking. consciousness exists. So we are zombies. We are zombies, yeah. Mo the co-host of my podcast, Mind Chat, which I don't know if I mentioned. <laughs> he is an illusionist. So I, I think consciousness is everywhere. He thinks it's nowhere. And, or at least in the sense philosophers talk about it. So, And they have one good episode that they drink wine for Christmas and they, dis- they, they take two positions that we put the link down below all oh, oh, right that, that was fine emphasize my <laughs> don't be put off it's terrible production we don't we don't we don't we're too busy to uh make beautiful videos like like you make videos but we just press broadcast and just have a chat and um what was it talking about yeah so so i i, I tried to defend that for a while i debated it i thought that was the scientific view but i, I just couldn't live with myself after you know i think i talk about i was just in a bar and enjoying a beer and cigarette you could smoke in bars in those days and just somehow strongly feeling my experiences and i just thought i can't believe this i've got consciousness and and then after that i i didn't know what to think and i i left academia i went to poland for a year taught english learn Polish and just try to forget about it, you know, and read some science that was less mysterious. Uh, and then I just came across um, an article by Thomas Nagel from the 70s on panpsychism. And actually this article, I mean, I guess he was quite pioneering talking about this in the 70s when it was just totally taboo. But even in that article, he was like, obviously this is not true, but look, it's, it's kind of interesting, Norja. <laughs> And anyway, I read that and I just thought, wow, this just makes sense. This solves the problems, uh, can accommodate both the scientific truth, but also the obvious reality of our feelings and experiences. And just that, you know, sense of intellectual peace. Um, and so I tried to find a uni- the one university in the UK that had a panpsychist professor, Galen Strawson. And started graduate study and it's gone okay. 
Yeah. So, so it, these things are not just abstract puzzles to me. I, I like how I ask you to describe kind of the person behind the theories, and you actually gave me the evolution of your world view. Mm. And it's kind of very interesting that uh, that's how you answer this question because this is how kind of you define yourself as well. What are your thoughts at which point of your life? That's interesting. Yeah, I suppose that's maybe I just couldn't think of anything interesting to say on the, <laughs> on the question you actually asked me. I suppose my life at the moment, I kind of got two jobs. There's the monastic job of just writing and thinking. And, you know, I'm so lucky that I can just spend my, it's like being a geek that gets paid to be a geek, you know, to just thinking about these things and writing. But also there's the public engagement stuff that's got more and more consuming. And um, and that's a very different thing. That's about trying to communicate and connect with people. And I guess I do a podcast pretty much every week now, usually on a Tuesday night for my little, um, and you know, that's that's a very different kind of experience. And I suppose I've got young kids as well. So I don't really have much of a social life at the moment. It's just thinking, podcasting, or playing with little children. But uh, <laughs> but I love it. It's, you know, I feel very lucky. So um, you came recently in this world of podcast. How, how many years ago you started being interested in this communication it's, online? It's, I suppose it's built up, but probably, I guess, with the book aimed at a general. So I, I published an academic book, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality. 2017. 2017, which is uh, pretty hard to read if, if maybe you don't have a background in academic philosophy. And then 2019, I published this book aimed at a general audience. Galileo's error. <laughs> On Amazon. Available Amazon in link. all good bookshops. <laughs> in all uh, good bookshops. Yeah, there's only one bookshop that sells it, but that's the only good one. Um, so I suppose, yeah, with coming up to that, I suppose was where it, I, I suppose it accelerated, and um, so kind of the it, last four or five years, you're getting started getting into the online communication. Yeah, yeah, and and, and learning to do it. You know, it was. I think I was saying to you before we went on. Let when I first sent the chapters to the publisher and they were like, okay, you've taken out the jargon, but you need some stories, you need some digressions, you need some autobiography, you know, you you need to make this a bit more. And that was like hard. And I was I had a bit of a long, dark night of the soul. I was thinking like, can I do this? I don't think I can do this. You know, and I think anything, any anytime you get somewhere in life, you have those moments of sort of, rejection or thinking i can't do this but then you get rounded and have a good night's sleep and um yeah i think my biggest problem at the moment is oh you have problems can't well it's <laughs> i'm joking it's <laughs> not a it's not a i feel bad complaining about it really but <laughs> relax you know calming down at weekends you know relaxing <laughs> you can't you know i just i i'm always miserable actually on a on a saturday and a monday because Saturday I'm trying to relax and just be in the moment and go for a walk or something. And then Monday I'm trying to, I'm, then I'm relaxed on Sunday. And then Monday I'm trying to get back and remember how to use willpower and start thinking about why are you talking about, why are we thinking about this crap? And so, yeah, that's, that's the problem for me. If anyone has any advice on getting into and out, I'd prefer to maybe like work for a month and then have a month off. Or something, you know, I find it hard to get in and out of that. Because I guess I work quite intensely, you know, so. You, you uh, always had, uh, I consider you uh, the most passionate philosopher oh. that I saw online. Really? Oh, that's so, really lovely. The way that you speak, and you are do this, and you are so <laughs> in person, and uh, you feel what you're yeah. saying. So, uh, so uh, I guess you I'm were... quite passionate about these things. <laughs> I, you know, I really do believe it. Uh, I mean, not in the sense of being certain. And I, you know, I love getting in the mindset of people who disagree with me. My podcast co-host Keith, you know, I just find it baffling how he thinks what he thinks. But I love trying to get in his head and trying to understand him. And you know, I think we need a bit more of that. You know, with polarization and. Uh, 
So, but yeah, but I, I do really believe this. I mean, I, I'm passionate and I want to change the world in a way. I want to, I want to get out of this scientific phase. Um, I think we need to appreciate that dealing with consciousness, for example, is not just about experiments. It's about bringing together what we know from experiments but also the privately known reality of our own conscious experience and appreciating that you're going to need to do some philosophy. You can't just answer this experiment. I think once we appreciate that, it, ch it's, it changes, sorry, it changes the whole way we think about science and the relationship to the world and the way we understand the universe. So yeah, I think I'm right. And I want to persuade people, hopefully not in too arrogant a way, but so this is kind of what you want to live when you die to live kind of your theories and like your points of view and to make them as broad as possible do you think about yeah. uh, your whatever like as your destiny or like the stuff that you want to leave behind do you think about this i don't really think much about when i'm dead actually <laughs> I, there was a philosopher um maybe i won't mention who recently got attacked by say they said they would be read after they died. And then lots of people on social media were saying, oh, I can't believe you're so arrogant. And I was thinking, I mean, it's not that I don't have an ego. I think I do to an extent. I think I'm lucky I'm not, I'm not that materialistic. I'm not that bothered about money or power. But I do have an ego to an extent, you know, I think I, and I think that's stupid. <laughs> I wrestle with that to some extent. I want to be a famous philosopher and, uh, I wrestle with that because I think that's that's stupid, you know. I mean, that's a small part of it. The the more fundamental thing is, I you know, I want to persuade people of these ideas, but there is some ego there as well. Why do you think it's stupid? I just think it's pointless, isn't it? It's like, I mean, any of those things like power for its own sake or money for its own sake, it's, it's, there's, it's like counting blades of grass or something. It's just, there's no point to it. Like pleasure is 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 good or understanding or truth or beauty these things are worth pursuing but just being so my well known is is it might is be stupid, bring you it? might bring you pleasure yeah to the extent that yeah i mean i it, i mean i i enjoy the pleasure of doing these kind of discussions and the the opportunities it affords me but i think when people have ego I think it's not it's not just the pleasure and often it can make people miserable it's just I guess it's something we've evolved for various reasons just wanting to stamp your name on the world and it becomes like a like you become like a black hole don't you you, ne you never get satisfied I think who was it was it some film star who said uh I wish everybody could be rich and famous so they could find out it doesn't make you happy you know <laughs> I think you know that yeah actually when I yeah when I was on a Joe Rogan podcast and then seeing like the views on it and I was thinking I, I got the hit of thinking oh, more views oh, more views and, but that that would never be satisfied will it until you're you know incredible some so famous that you can't walk out the door and then you're just miserable so anyway so I, I can't deny to some extent and I fight it fight it in myself there's an ego, but actually I'm after I die, I was just, I'm, I don't think I'm bothered if anyone remembers me <laughs> uh, for some reason. But uh, Can you tell me a bit more about your experience with Joy Rogan? Because uh, it's kind of, it's, I think it's like writing a book as well, that, that interview, because like uh, millions of people are, are watching your ideas and all this stuff. And like, how do, how was your experience? Are you, you were, uh, stress before you go went like how uh, probably you got these questions a million times I and I have, I, actually. Be, because oh you, I get it a lot from uh, which is quite nice now a lot from our students oh uh, you know coming up and asking me about it which is quite nice uh, <laughs> because I met but, Elon but Musk I met Elon Musk recently mm, and then that. everyone asked me how was that how was that what was it like so sometimes it gets a bit annoying but because I'm curious I try to follow <laughs> my curiosity no no <laughs> so. that's fine uh, I think was I stressed? I think I was a little bit nervous, actually. I suppose, yeah, more so. It than... was uh, re uh, three, uh, two years ago, three years ago. Uh, 
yeah, we were supposed to do it actually at the very start of COVID. The month COVID started, I was supposed to go to LA and then, um, but then COVID hit and then it was two years before, as soon as the, U- the US opened to the UK, I went, which was, uh, yeah, what was it? 2021 or 2020? I can't remember now. Um, and I did Lex Friedman as well, was there? Yeah, I, I think in hindsight, I, I think I could have done a better job. Um, I think I, I watched Joe Rogan in preparation talking to scientists and I didn't watch one of the one of the only interviews he's done with a philosopher, Nick Bostrom. And I think if I'd have watched that, I think his philosophy is sort of, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not about, oh, here's the evidence. It's about chains of reasoning. And Interesting. maybe I didn't sort of, and look, that's, it's a very specific kind of intelligence. Sometimes when I say I'm a philosopher, people say, oh, you must be very intelligent, but it's a very specific kind of intelligence. It's like, you know, there's mathematical intelligence. Some people find very easy. I struggle with mathematical intelligence, or there's various kinds of practical intelligence. Philosophy is like, it's, it's about thinking of real things consciousness or morality or knowledge but sort of abstracted from their normal from everything about their real context you know you take consciousness and you say what is it in itself independently of how it happens to be and that's that way of sort of thinking quite it's it's hard for people and I think maybe we got a bit lost of me trying to say, run through the argument. I maybe would have, maybe, st- I think I should have spent longer talking about the problem of conscious, why it's a mystery in the first place. Like you asked me, you know, like, uh, what's this difference between which kinds of brain activity go with consciousness and why? You know, I should have really nailed that at the start, but, and probably I've just got a bit better at communicating, I think, in those couple of years, but. Anyway, it was a learning experience and it was fun. Is it the nice same uh, teaching university students and doing podcasting? Uh, kind of is a similar thing or? I think it's made me much better at it, actually, to be honest. I mean, you, what? Well, which the one you are... podcasting has made me much better at teaching, you know, oh. obviously learning to communicate. And I didn't realize how bad I was at it, actually. But, <laughs> you know you can express things without jargon. You know? um, I'm still pretty crap with PowerPoint slides though. I need to, uh, I'm not very good at technology to be honest. Um, How much time it took you to write your, your new book? Uh, a y- one year. So I had a, I had a term off teaching to really concentrate on it. I wrote a draft quite intensely. And then I think, so that was October to Christmas. Uh, 2020? What year are we now? 2021? That was 2021, October to Christmas. And then 2022, uh, just working on it. As you, you get comments from reviewers, from the publisher hires four people, five people in this case, to give their comments and then you revise it. And so, you know, I was doing other things as well. And and then, yeah, just submitted the final version. Do you learn a lot of stuff by writing uh, your book? Like, do you put your thoughts all together and you're like, oh, wow, now I understood better or like... Absolutely. Actually, talking about it now, starting to talk about it in podcasts make me think, ah, I could have explained this better. <laughs> you know, but actually, what, the be- what, where you learn most as a philosopher, right? This is, you give, what you do as a philosopher, you give talks at, conferences and you know you get invited like we have a guest speaker every week from another university you give your talk and what happens then is the other philosophers try to tear apart your argument <laughs> yeah you know? uh in a nice way usually yes, but yes. you know <laughs> seeing objections that's really helpful because you see oh my god i haven't thought of this i haven't thought of that i haven't and that is that is where you learn as a as a philosopher i think actually and there's a lot of i mean as, as I say, we're in a, prop, a moment where people don't really know what philosophy is. And actually, there's a lot of scientists whose names I might not mention who are really doing philosophy 
and maybe not doing it that great because they haven't had that. They haven't had that experience of presenting their ideas and getting them torn apart. That is like really forms your ideas. So you, Even if they've got quite interesting stuff. That's Certain the scientists essence you think I of. like, yeah. And, and, and they, Sean Carroll's not like this, right? Because he talks to philosophers a lot. And so he, but a lot of scientists, and maybe have interesting ideas and people think, oh, well, they're a scientist. But actually a lot of it is philosophy and they haven't had this experience of, so that's where you learn most, I think. But um, yeah, they've both informed each other, actually. The pod, you know, you learn something different talking to non-philosophers because maybe the philosoph the academics are wrapped up in this certain way of thinking about it that's been there like that for decades. And then you talk to a member of the public and, you know, they ask a question that just cuts through and maybe questions some assumption that nobody's questioned. But that, so that one, what you're describing, also you need to be self-aware and also not try to like you need to try to see the other position yeah for you to take but because some people you might take yeah. apart their arguments but they're just the same <laughs> even if you give them the most beautiful point of view different wise or even they never question that yeah so it it, it, uh, it comes with a lot of self-awareness yeah well this yeah. is the thing about you've got to you've got i always tell my students you know, you're not being marked on what you think because all these things are so controversial. And I always say to, you know, students know my views because they're reading stuff by me or whatever. But, I, you know, you're not going to get marks for agreeing with me or disagreeing with me. It's about the character, the quality of your argument. I was getting to Martin Luther King then, the character. Of, anyway, it's about, but you've got to have your opponent in your mind. You've got to get in the mindset of your opponent you know, when I'm writing stuff, I'll write my argument, then I'll try and get in the mindset of my opponent and try and tear it apart. And, um, you know, and when I, so it's not easy. And when I'm arguing with someone, I can't deny part of me wants them to be wrong. <laughs> you know, I want to be right. But there's a bigger part of me that thinks, are they right? I want to know if they are right. I want to know. I mean, that should ultimately be your drive. And I, you know, I, I like to think that I'm fundamentally driven by just, I just want to know what's true, whether yeah. it's panpsychism, whether it's materialism, I just want to know what's true. And, um, does it matter if other person had the true idea? <laughs> right. It shouldn't do. As I say, I can't deny there's not some ego in me that wants. <laughs> no, it's just me. <laughs> would would I would I be hurt if you know? I don't know. There was some other panpsychist saying the same things, but you know, I, I nobody knew me, and everyone knew, you know. There's some part of me that would say, "No, it was, look at me." I can't deny that, and I fight against it. But I like to think the important thing is that what you're fundamentally driven by is truth or understanding or social progress or something how do we learn faster oh. that is that's a good question are you thinking of any particular area of learning or just i mean i think i think like this generation with podcasting and everything you were saying yourself you know you're so young and you've been um watching the leading experts I almost about understood what consciousness <laughs> what they're trying to say I almost understood at least as much as anyone else does <laughs> but you know I don't think I think these things need to exist together don't they I don't think you know podcasting should replace academia you know ultimately if you're going to contribute to the field you need to read the books and the articles but I mean this generation is a, getting a good understanding of the work of leading people in all these fields. And I think that is, so it's, you know, it's people worry about, you know, my sister worries about my teenage nieces, you know, on TikTok all the time. And you're worrying about your uh, concentration spans, you know, and so on. But on the other hand, we're absorbing all this information. And I think, I think we've got to, work out ways of structuring society that are not just 
dominated by the market everywhere, adverts everywhere, adverts all over your public space. Maybe we could have some public spaces where you don't have adverts. Maybe we could <laughs> Is it possible? Nationalize YouTube. <laughs> we should nationalize YouTube. We need a we need a world government first. But uh maybe the United Nations should nationalize YouTube. I mean seriously, you could you know just get rid of all the adverts and stop anyway. <laughs> So yeah, it's. I mean, I think it's about taking t again, coming back to democratic taking control of the way we run society to accentuate the great things about technology and find ways of dealing with the negative effects. And if you're just constantly dominated by profit, 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 then it's just hard to do that. In your personal life, where you found uh, you you spoke, you found a lot of learning when people tell apart your arguments. Yeah. So, what other stuff you found that there is a lot of learning? For example, when you read books, when you speak with other people, when you shower, <laughs> mm. <laughs> where learning come came to you in your life? There's there's lots of different forms of learning. Um, and there's lots of different things you can want to learn about consciousness. I mean, if if you're interested in consciousness itself, what it's like to be a human being, don't listen to philosophers, don't listen to scientists, read some literature, you know, read James Joyce, read Dostoevsky, you know, read... The, this is how we learn what it's like to be a human being, which is... So important, you know, I, I always say to my students, when it get philosophy gets abstract, as we've seen today, and get these technical jargon and all that. But ultimately, what we're talking about is your own conscious experience that you have immediate awareness of, and we should remember that and use yes. that to ground us. So yeah, I always try to, I read a lot of philosophy, but I always try to uh, read read a lot of literature as well to, you know, um, a lot of, I mean, look, great TV these days. When I was younger, I'm sounding old now. When I was younger, TV was crap. You know, you got some good movies, but TV was just, and we got these, you know, incredible TV series, which are just like, you know, epic drama, aren't they? So yeah, I think you've got to diversify and specialize, but also art and culture and talking to as many different kinds of people as possible. Uh, people different to so yourself. So to learn faster, boys and girls, watch the sunset. Mm. <laughs> I love, I love morning and evening light. I think that's when I feel closest to God, whatever that means. You know, just the soft light in the morning, or I just think, my God, there's a point to existence. And I think actually my new book is, you know, both of, actually, my, my last book and this book, a lot of it, most of it is just the building the argument, you know, the scientific and philosophical argument. But the last chapter, I think about the implications for human existence and this new book on the purpose of existence, the purpose of the universe. I think it has become quite important to me to live in hope that there's a purpose to the universe and to see what the, the good that I do, the small amount of good I do is contributing in some way to to a greater purpose. That also helps me keep my ego in check. You know, I think a, a purpose that's, you know, maybe we don't yet fully understand is still unfolding. And I think that can be a very meaningful way of living your life, to live in hope that there's there's a point to it all, even if we don't fully understand what that point is. Uh, beautiful and uh, I need to say because I was saying all the time that I will say this you made me vegetarian <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> because wow. uh you you were talking about I was seeing more like the physical list of you before I started watching your videos so and then you spoke about oh the little things has consciousness and what if the fly has consciousness, what if the uh, chickens have consciousness? So I'm like, ah, I don't know if they have, if they don't, I don't know, I don't believe anything, but if they do, maybe they are, it's it's, it's not 
that cool for ten dollars just for me to kill a chicken. So because of all the stuff that I was watching, kind of this view, you made me become vegetarian. So wow, that's incredible. <laughs> it's, it's 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 quite humbling, really, to have that kind of impact on someone. I mean, I suppose actually I've got in the opposite direction. People always think I'm going to be vegan and get annoyed at me for not being. But I think. The problem is, I think plants and trees are conscious, right? So if you if you think just animals yeah. are conscious, <laughs> yes, then and I, no, like, and I think this is important for our relationship to the environment because if you know if you th- if you're a materialist, a tree is just a mechanism. <laughs> Who gives a shit about a mechanism? You know, you would, and it's ridiculous to hug a mechanism, right? And maybe it's important for us, or it looks pretty, or whatever. But if you think a tree is a conscious organism, albeit of a quite different alien kind then it's a locus of moral value in its own right but so if you don't think plants and trees are conscious then there's a nice clear moral dividing line you can say i'm only gonna sorry i'm only gonna eat things that are not conscious so you can be vegan but if you do think plants and trees are conscious you know you've got to eat something i guess you can eat fruit so i guess what i do i i now i I call it a humanitarianism is to try and just be really strict about only consuming animal products with with the highest uh, welfare standards. And then my vegan friends say, well, it's it's still cruel in many ways. But maybe it's still better if you influence the market by getting welfare standards up, even if they're not perfect. Maybe that's better than just being vegan and and then and maybe welfare you don't, you don't alter of, uh, anything. Uh, welfare of the plants as well how we <laughs> we plant them all together closely yeah, and so, no, we so should, it's a never ending argument we so. should be aiming at animals and plants flourishing and flourishing as the kind of beings they are i like aristotle's notion of flourishing a bit different to happiness like happiness is like oh i feel good you know you can feel good playing video games or whatever, but or being on heroin. But flourishing, you know, is something deeper. So um, Wow, what yeah. beautifully uh, said. But just but just to, to be more specific about that, people never people are vegan or they just eat anything. And I guess some people buy organic meat or whatever, but very few people, you know, go into a restaurant and say to the waiter, you know, what what are your animal welfare standards? Or when they're buying chocolate, wants to know what if more people did that I see. I think that would have a huge input. So people still had animal products, but in every bit of life demanded high welfare standards. I think that could really influence the market. Um, so that's what I try to do. I've, I've slackened a bit on that recently because my kids eat any old crap, but <laughs> and then I have their leftovers. But and anyway, I, I'm so rambling. I, I love to end it on what you said, that flourishing is a good word to see life. Not trying to happy happiness and like because you can't get up in the what happiness uh, is, is like cocaine or whatever. Yeah, is like flourishing. It's a good mm. thing to live by. <laughs> Absolutely, I love you. Thank you for doing oh, this. Thank you, Phidias. It's we. It's been such a lovely conversation. Bye, guys. What do we do? Do I wait here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you for listening. For Bye. <laughs>